What's cracking you do? Welcome back to the channel. It's Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football as always. It's your boy Nicholas. It's time to start looking forward to the season. Week three wrapped up. So it's very unlikely we see the starters in the week four preseason games. So we have the best idea of lineups, of rosters, of depth charts, as, as clear of a picture as we're gonna get in the preseason before things actually get started off. So today, I wanna get into a video kinda of looking forward, projecting the future. Guys that maybe we don't wanna draft. We don't see the draft capital equated to what we're gonna get from them. These are the kind of guys that are great trade targets because you don't have to use draft capital on them. You could wait till maybe they flame out, they have a slow start, and then you pounce on them. I'm not one to project a player and their season long value on strength of schedule. Cause things in the NFL change so quick, man. They change quicker than Obama giving handshakes to a white person versus a black person. Injuries happen, trades happen, people just break out that you would have no idea, you wouldn't see coming. You could be a bottom barrel defense one year, a top barrel defense next year, so you can't just assume from year to year everything is the same, especially when looking at strength of schedule. But there is a time and place for everything, and that is when it comes to small sample sizes, such as looking at the first few weeks of the season. And this is the time to bounce on players who maybe have a tough schedule in the beginning, or their high upside picks, rookies, late round picks, right, who might start off slow, but have very favorable matchup, or it might just take them a little while to crack the lineup. Those are the guys you keep your eye on for trades and waivers. So it does pay to sit on some guys. So we're to Rachel Starr. Today I'm gonna give you my top three trade targets from weeks one to four, including an honorable mention, why you shouldn't draft them, why you should trade for them, when you should trade for them, and why. So let's get into it. I also want to throw this in before we start the video, and this is not a plug to try to get more followers on Twitter, but I get a lot of questions about like the subscriber leagues, updated rankings, and things like that about the draft guide. This is why you should follow me on Twitter, because those little comments and stuff are things that I tweet out about all the time. I'm not going to make an individual video every time like something minor happens, but I could send a tweet, obviously, to let you know when the rankings are going to be out, or let you know when the subscriber league winners have been picked. Definitely follow me on Twitter, which is linked here already if you're not. Just want to throw that in there. First up on my list, we have Dez. Bryant. Dallas Cowboys wide receiver. He's been creeping up draft boards as of late because he's looked good in the preseason. Him and Dak have had that connection. I still say the second round, which is where you're going to have to draft him, is too, too early, especially for the beginning of the season. You know, he plays in a division that he's going to see a lot of, lot of tough matchups, and the beginning of his schedule is no different. You look at it here. His first four weeks are brutal, to say the least. The easiest matchup he has of the first four weeks is against the Rams when he goes against Tremaine Johnson, who was still a top 25 cornerback according to the Pro Football Focus rankings. Now you see the grades on there, and the grades are, are listed like this. If you're 50 to 70, below average, 70 to 80 is average, 80 to 85 is above average, 85 to 90 is high quality, and 90 plus is elite. So everyone he plays in the first four weeks is above average at worst, and most of them are high quality or elite. All four of these matchups, the Giants, Denver, Cardinals, Rams, all four of those teams were ranked top seven in the NFL last year in pass defense. The Norris Jenkins could be Cromartie, Akeem Tlaib, Chris Harris, Patrick Peterson, Tremaine Johnson, all extremely tough matchups over the first four weeks of the season. You're thinking, hey, you know what? Dez is pretty good in his own right, right? He is an elite wide receiver. He can, he, the matchups don't really matter that much, do they? Let's take a look. I'm gonna give Dez the benefit of the doubt here, right? What I did was I went back to 2012. From 2012 to 2016, I wanted to see Dez versus top ranked pass defenses. And like I said, these are all top seven from last year, but we're gonna extend that to top 12 just to give him the benefit of the doubt. Here are his splits versus top 12 pass defenses versus bottom 20 pass defenses. The splits are huge. There's a major drop off when Dez goes against elite pass defenses. His fantasy production falls by more than seven points per game in PPR formats. That's a tough pill to swallow for owners that use their second round pick. If you're using a second round pick on wide receiver, that should be someone that's a no-brainer, right? You want him in your lineup every single week. Now, when you have to start the season against really, really tough guys, you know, Denver, Arizona, Jenkins, like, you're going to have to debate whether you want, I had a question, Des Bryant, or I think it was like Kelvin Benjamin week one. Like, do you really want to have to debate your second round pick versus your sixth or seventh round pick? Probably not. That's why I'm saying 
Don't draft him in second round, trade for him after the slow start. It's not to say that Dez isn't talented in his own right, but let someone else kind of eat that first four weeks of the season. By that time, man, they'll learn to hate Dez. That's when you jump on him like some kangaroos, baby. Now, following those week four games, he gets some nice matchups. He gets Green Bay, a bye, then San Francisco. Much, 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 much worse than the past game. By that time, he'll be pissed off, right? He'll have a bunch of poor performances lining up back to back to back. The media's gonna be like, Dez, why you suck, bro? And he's gonna be like, I ain't suck. I don't know. He'll be pissed off. Then he gets a couple easy, easy matchups where I expect him to go bananas. Green Bay, dead last in pass defense last year. San Francisco was 29th ranked. So what I'll say is this, when you're looking to trade for him, most people will understand that he's had tough matchups which is why I suggest not waiting till after week four to trade for him because by then they'll see that he has a Green Bay matchup, right? What I would do is I'd look to trade after week three because he's got that matchup with Patrick Peterson and that week four matchup is when he has the easiest of the first four matchups. You want to say easiest in quotations because still not easy, but that's the most likely game for him to actually have a big game, right? It's at home versus a weaker cornerback, it's most likely for him, you know, to have a big game. And if Dez has that big game, you use your second round pick on him, you know, you're not looking to jump off him right away. So if he has a big game in week four, owners are much less likely to want to give him up. So start the trade offers in week three. That way, if the other owner accepts the trade, great. Then you have him with nice matchups coming up. If he doesn't, at least the owner will have that thought in his mind like, oh, you know what, Dez, there is interest in Dez. If he does have a weak game again against the Rams in week four, if he struggles again, then boom, he'll be ready to he'll be ready to send Dez over your way. So that's why I'm looking at Dez as a as a good trade target. You get a lot, a lot of the strong matchups out of the way right away. There's juicy matchups to come, and he does not fare well against the better matchups. Okay, trade target new Numero dos, Isaiah Crowell, running back of the Cleveland Browns. Now, unlike y'all, I don't even have the chance to draft this guy because in my keeper league, he's being kept for like a 13th round pick. If you want Crowell this year, if you're in a, a savvier league, you're going to have to use probably a third or fourth round pick to get him. They'll probably drop a little bit because people, you know, people probably assume he's a boring player. They don't want the Browns running back. So he could drop if you're in a, in a less competitive league. But the reason I, I like Crowell, the reason I'd want to trade for him is probably, it's not the same reason as Dez. It's not the matchups. It's not anything like that. It's probably a reason maybe you're not expecting. It's about Deshaun Kaiser and strictly about Kaiser and Kaiser's ability to run the football as a quarterback. This is a little fantasy football trick that surprisingly not a lot of people know about. And it just comes down to the fact that running backs in fantasy, their production skyrockets when they have a mobile quarterback, a running quarterback under center compared to just a pocket passer. From a common sense standpoint, it just makes sense. I mean, think about it. The defenses have to account for not only one primary rusher, but two, right? They have to put an extra defender on the quarterback, keep an eye on the quarterback. The edge defenders have to do the same thing. So they can't just be thinking if they're running the ball, it's going to the running back. Now it can go one of two ways. So I expect this to be the same thing with Isaiah Crowell and in 2017. And we can look back at sample sizes, right? We had Crowell running with Robert Griffin III last year. I know like people probably forgot that he actually played quarterback. But you can see we had five game sample size of Crowell with RG3 versus without RG3. And it wasn't like RG3 was good last year. It wasn't like RG3 was so good that that's why Crowell's numbers were there. It's because RG3 is mobile. You see the fantasy points are increased by about three points per game in all all the formats. His rushing yards went 48 yards a game to 82 yards a game. His touchdown total was almost doubled from 0.36 a game to 0.6. And then you just go back throughout history. You look at Alfred Morris, right? With versus without RG3. The numbers speak for themselves. He is way, 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 way better when he had RG3 under center. I'll leave this up here for a second for you guys to take a look. We see it was Sean McCoy with versus without Tyrod Taylor over the last two years. I know this is a super, super, super small sample size and the quarterback probably played a role because it was probably a drop off from Tyrod Taylor. But again, I think it speaks volume. This is something that's tried and tried and true. You could look at probably any running back that's played with Russell Wilson and without Russell Wilson. It's the same thing, Cam Newton does a lot of the same for D'Angelo Williams, for Jonathan Stewart throughout history if you want to put it that way. Now, I actually wrote this blog post because I, I do all my videos based off blog posts. I wrote this about a week and a half ago. That we didn't have the news that Deshaun Kaiser was going to be the starting quarterback, but they said it's been announced. He is a starting quarterback for week one, which is even better. He's looked really good this preseason uh, through two games. He completed 19 of 31 passes, 258 passing yards, a touchdown, no interceptions, 
And most importantly, he added 47 rushing yards and a touchdown on just eight carries. So he brings that dynamic to this team, which I think is going to be incredible for him. So let's take a look at their, their schedule. Weeks one through six, you see a mixed bag of opponents, right? Divisional matchups, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Cincy. It's a mix of, of teams that are really good, are average, are really bad, right? You see a couple fours, 12s, 30, whatever. And uh, nothing about this, this schedule, the first six weeks for Crowell, invites me to, to necessarily draft him or scares me away at all. You know, it's just a mixed bag of everything, of good, bad, and whatever run defenses. Historically, I look back and there's almost no change in Crowell's fantasy production when going against top rushing defenses versus average or bottom rush, right? Here is a split for Crowell since he came in 2014 to 2016. The in split is versus top 10 rushing defenses, top third of the league versus bottom 22. In PPR leagues, it's 0.1 per game difference and it's a pretty big sample size so nothing about him playing good defenses versus bad defense necessarily scares me off so why do i suggest trading for him after week four if the schedule isn't a bad a big factor for me or why why not just draft him outright why not week two why not week seven you know so this is why one i don't necessarily want to draft him outright in the third or fourth round because i think his ceiling is capped just from being on the browns and i you know i wouldn't suggest trading for him for like in week two because you know, no one, no one who drafts a player wants to trade him in the first week or two of the season. So that was kind of off the board. The second reason Kaiser wasn't the starter when I when I wrote this, so I said if Kaiser somehow isn't the starter to open the season, he will be by after week four, but we already learned that he is. Third reason to wait on it a little bit is the fact that Kaiser is a rookie, right? And I think it's going to take him a few weeks to kind of adjust to the game speed of the NFL. You know, rookies, for the most part, start off kind of slow. We saw Wentz like get out to a great start last year, but I think, you know, it will take Kaiser, someone who's, who's very young, a lot of raw talent, but I think mentally he's going to have to adapt to the game for a few weeks and kind of get better with his decision makings even though he's looked great this offseason in terms of like options and doing the right reads and stuff. But waiting a little bit just because he's a rookie is why I suggest waiting until like week three or four to trade for Crowell. So by week four, I think the offense will be running pretty fluidly. They have a much improved offensive line. They went out and signed a few guys through for agency. They were already pretty good last year and now they're going to be much, much better. And you also look back at their schedule. Week five, they play the Jets. Week six, they play Houston. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that either of them are bad rush defenses because they're both pretty good but the likelihood of them actually being the browns being in those games right against the jets against the texans who are a ground and pound defensive team they're going to keep the games close at a minimum so that means the game scripts will be in crowell's favor when last year you know you play a team like pittsburgh there's a good chance that pittsburgh throws up like a 35 spot and the browns are playing catch up for the most part but against the jets and, and houston like week five week six i would expect them to be in the game and I, I like crowell to see like 15 to 18 carries during those games i'm not here to make a case for drafting crowell but it's relatively unheard of for mo he's not like a household name right now but the reason, he was a five-star recruit coming out of high school, like really, really, really big-time recruit coming out of high school. He won the SEC Freshman of the Year Award when he played at Georgia. He was really good in high school, really good in college. He got kicked off Georgia's football team because of some off-the-field issues, which is which was like the downfall of why he's not such a hyped-up running back. But, you know, he proved it last year that he could do the damn thing, man. And in 2016, with, with the worst offensive line that he's going to have this year, he kind of proved that he's going to be the center of this offense. He averaged 4.8 yards per carry and also added 43 catches. So, you know, for a lot of you guys in less competitive leagues, you know, owners, like I said, don't care for a boring player like Crowell, the Browns running back. So he might drop much later than he should. In that case, you know, if he drops, definitely go out, draft him by all means, whatever sinks your submarines, or you can wait for a slow start, which I kind of anticipate happening based on, on Kaiser being the quarterback. And then if he does drop, that means that people weren't that high on him in the first place. And if he does come out with a slow start, that'd be even more reason for an owner to want to trade him. They're like, ah, oh, this guy's not really doing anything. I didn't really love him from the start. A couple weeks into the season, he's, he's not doing that well. Boom, I think you can get him for a great value. You probably won't have to trade too much in order to get him. And I also want to say for this video in terms of like, I'm not throwing in guys that you should try to trade, who you should be trading in order to get Isaiah Correll because a few things. One, that's going to be so subjective on a league to league basis, right? It depends on your scoring. It depends on your format. By week three or four, a lot of things can change. So I'm not going to tell you to trade someone. Like I'm not going to give you names to trade right now because who knows? They might even be irrelevant by the time week four comes around. Also, when you're looking for a trade, you got to look for, it depends a lot on the other guy's team. You're not going to trade uh, a Tyler Eifert for a Crowell to a guy that already has Rob Gronkowski. So that, that depends a lot on your situation. That's very individual. I can't just throw out names and expect it to work for everybody. So that's why I'm not really listing guys that you should be looking to trade for for these guys. 
Third on my list, we hit a wide receiver, we hit a running back, let's get to the quarterback position. And it's my boy Marcus Mariota, quarterback out of Tennessee. I'm all aboard the Mariota hype train this season. I think he takes a really, really big step forward, and I think he's a great fantasy option at quarterback. Nothing really not to like here in this offense, right? Three great weapons between Rashard Matthews, Eric Decker, sixth overall pick, Corey Davis, great tight end in Delaney Walker, an elite offensive line, ranked number three by Pro Football Focus, and then arguably an elite running back duo in DeMarco Murray and Derrick Henry. There's really no flaws on this offense. However, the schedule is scary for me for Mariota. They do open up against Oakland, which should be probably a shootout, and he should put up fine fantasy numbers. But outside of that, the, the Titans schedule gets really, really, really rough for Mariota. After week one, they play at Jacksonville, then they play versus Seattle, and then they play at Houston in their next three games. Jacksonville and Houston were both tied for the second best pass defense in the NFL last season. So top two. Seattle was actually ranked middle of the pack, but I think a lot of that has to do with Earl Thomas being injured throughout most of the season. And that plays a, that played a big role in Seattle's lack of, I guess, production in, in pass defense. So with him back, I think Seattle takes a big bounce back in, for their defense. So that's three out of the first four weeks. That's three really tough matchups outside of week one. And I think all three of those games where they had the touch, tough passing matchups, you know, Jacksonville, Houston, Seattle, all those games should be very rush-oriented. You know, Jacksonville obviously wants to run the ball for net. Houston's always been a top-run offensive team. So I think that, that game definitely caters more to a run style than, than passing for Mariota. Dude, and, and then what I, I did was I looked into Mariota performing against top-ranked pass defenses versus bottom-ranked, and it's actually like kind of jaw-dropping. Played 12 games, and this is first the top 16-ranked pass defenses. So just the top half versus the bottom half, straight up. Look at the drop-off in points. So almost 12 fantasy points difference versus top half pass D versus bottom half pass D. And it's not even like elite. I'm not doing like the top five or the top eight pass defenses. This is straight up the top 16. It's like staggering. It's 80 less passing yards a game. It's 1.35 passing touchdowns less. Just really, 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 really big drop off here. It's almost to the point where you can't even use Mariota against really good defenses. 12 points of a game fantasy wise, that's, that's 150 passing yards. 20 rushing yards and a passing touchdown per game, all three of those. And that just means that he's amazing versus the, the lesser half teams. And the other thing to consider is that Corey Davis has been week to week with his hamstring injury, hasn't had any preseason work. Eric Decker kind of rolled up his ankle. So both of these guys are are a little bit questionable for week one. So by the time like week three, week four rolls around, they should be fine. They should be back on the field. They should be, have it. They've, they should have already been in games for sure. And they should be uh, in shape, back, ready ready to roll for this offense. I think this, this offense might get off to a little bit of a slow start. But week four or five, I think is like when you pounce on Mariota. And I think the rest of the way, because remember, he plays divisional games against the Colts, too. So he has two games against them. And you get out of the way Jacksonville, Houston, and Seattle. So a very tough portion of his of his defense. So I think if he struggles in all three of those games, he should be a very viable trade option for you. But I mean, listen, if you want to draft Mariota, by all means. But don't expect a strong start to him following after their week one opener. What you could do is draft Mariota and then later look for a second quarterback with, with a much easier string of games during that week two to four. One guy did find a pair with Mariota during that stretch for y'all risky type of folks, Jay Cutler. So in week two, he plays the Chargers, week three, the Jets, week four, the Saints. Not great, but much easier than Mariota's schedule. And that Saints week four game is very juicy. But he should be back, he should be right back on schedule, Mariota. After those first four weeks, he gets Miami, Indy, and then Cleveland. So just mm, incredible matchups following those first four weeks. So those are my top three guys that I think are great trade targets at, at those positions in the early weeks of the season. Look for around week three to four to kind of get into those guys. Before I get into my honorable mention name, do me a favor. If you like this video, scroll down a little bit, hit that thumbs up, leave a comment down below if you have any other good trade targets. Oh, I just got lightheaded. Woo! I think I've been talking too fast. I think I talk so fast and I forget to breathe sometimes. Match that with a lot of caffeine is probably not a good combo. Anyway, so honorable mention, Joe Mixon. I am, I'm in the majority here. I have pretty much the same view as most people. He's an elite talent. There's no argument there for Joe Mixon. The question is, how much work is Hill gonna get in front of him? How much work is Geo gonna get as the passing down back? We've seen Hill start all of their preseason games and we've seen him do not amazing, but not terrible as most people kind of expected. So as Mixon kind of creeps up into the third and fourth round of drafts, I'm getting more nervous 
about drafting him, which is why I think I'm leaning off drafting him at those spots and looking for a trade, especially if Hill's getting a lot of work in the early season and he struggles or Mixon doesn't get enough work. That's exactly how I, I kind of see this, this backfield playing out, right? Hill's not going anywhere, at least for the early portion of the season. I think eventually he'll crawl his way out of the backfield and Joe Mixon will take over, but it won't be that early. I think it comes down to how patient is the owner of Mixon in your league. And you look at the Bengals' opening schedule, their first five weeks. Those first three weeks are tough. Baltimore, Houston, Green Bay, all top 12 run defenses. Not a lot of touchdowns scored against them. Great yards per carry. Baltimore's always tough. That in-division uh, matchup is, is tough. Houston's always good. Getting J.J. Watt back should be even better. Green Bay, terrible passing defense, but actually very, very, very good against the run last year. So those first three ma matchups, while I expect Hill to play a role in the backfield, it's also against tough matchups. So that's two things working against Mixon, which is why I probably expect him to be uh, get off to a really slow start. Now, it, it's possible both guys struggle in those first three, four weeks, but after those first three matchups, they get Cleveland and then they get Buffalo, both awful as run defenses. But it's also likely that the Mixon owner knows that they're going to be playing Cleveland in week four and they're expecting it and they're going to hold on. And after Buffalo, the Bengals get the Steelers and the Colts both ranked poor against the run last year. So a lot of good matchups after those first three weeks. So what I would say is it might actually be worth offering something big for Mixon after week two. You know, if he struggles versus Baltimore, struggles versus Houston, I know it's early and the owner might not want to give up on Mixon that early. But if you wait till after week three and the owner sees that he's playing Cleveland, there's a very small chance that he gives Mixon up. Even if you have to give up someone that's around the same draft value as Mixon after week two, I would say go for it because you're getting probably the worst part of what you're going to get from Mixon. You know, the early games where Hill is having a big role in the offense combined with tough matchups. Get those out of the way. Trade someone who the owner wants. Look at his team. Kind of maybe play, throw two players in for one for Mixon. And I think he'll be sitting pretty by the time week four hits and they got that Cleveland matchup. But I'm definitely getting a little more nervous about taking Mixon in the third to fourth round of fantasy drafts after seeing what we've seen in the preseason. So that's that, man. Those are my top three trade targets with Joe Mixon kind of rounding out the honorable mentions. And I'd also say for those of you who bought my draft guide, again, I, I sent out updated rankings following the Ware and Edelman injury and also following some of the week three preseason games. I didn't get around to doing all of them. So updated rankings will be out to you by tomorrow. I usually try to send them out around 2 or 3 p.m. Eastern time via email. So thank you again. And if you haven't purchased it, check out the website. I'll link it up here. $4.99. Don't buy coffee like me and buy this. And, uh, and that's that. So give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. Comment down below something, I don't know, fantasy football related. If you've got any questions, I will gladly answer them. I'll gladly argue with you. That's that. And I'll see y'all on the next episode.